open door. Hallelujah. The Bible says that all those that are weary and heavy laden come to the Lord and he will give you rest. Are there any that are weary and heavy laden today? Let's come before the Lord and he will give us rest. Let's come into his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise. There's a song that we used to sing in England when we went camping and it was, it's a beautiful day and I praise God for the weather. That's usually when we ended up with about six inches of water in our tent, but that's okay. It's still a beautiful day because God is in charge. He's on the throne and he has his hand upon each one of us. So let's just come before him. Let's give him thanks. That's what the word tells us to do. Let's enter his gates with thanksgiving and he will give you rest. Amen. Hallelujah. Father God, we just want to thank you for all that you are doing in each one of us, Lord God, for the provision that you have given us, for your love toward us. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that as we come into your presence with thanksgiving, as we come into your courts with praise, Lord, that you will give us rest, your rest. Lord, as we know that you are on the throne and you are in control. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Please stand with us and sing.
God, that you are here and that we can rely on you. Thank you, God, that just that because of your son, we can be saved. And I just pray, God, that during the worship, we will just feel your presence and be open to hearing from you.
that your love for us doesn't, doesn't really make sense when we know how, how we are and how holy, how perfect, how, how majestic you are, God, and how we maybe mess up a million times. But your love for us never changes. Your love is, is not understandable to our minds, God. We just thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that your love covers a multitude of sins and that you will never let us go. You will keep pursuing us no matter how we run from you, God. We just thank you for who you are.
Just let that thought of God's love just soak in. He loves you. He loves you unconditionally. Let His love flow over you right now. Father, I pray for a deeper revelation of Your love within our hearts. Lord, that we will know that in Your hands we are secure. We thank You for all that You've done for us, for Jesus coming, for Jesus living on this earth, a sinless life, and yet He went to the cross to pay for our sins so we could have eternity with You. Thank You for Your love. Thank you that you are working out all things together for good in our lives. Just continue to praise you, Lord. May your heart of praise, may praise toward you just continue to increase in our hearts. May it just increase in our hearts. love is for each and every one of us. Everyone that's in this room, everyone that's outside of these four walls. It's inconceivable how God can love us so much, but He does. And He wants to pour out that love on each one of us. And that love chases away all fear. There's no fear where His love is. So reach out. Reach up to Him and say, Lord, I receive Your love. I receive Your love. Thank You for Your love. Thank You for Your love that You want to lavish upon us. And Lord, help me to give over my life so that I can love in the same way. He loves You, church. He loves You. Thank You, Lord Jesus, for that love. Thank You, Lord, for that love. Thank you for your love. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Max is going to be sharing the word this morning. We invited Max to share once a while back, uh, and we thought it'd be good to invite him back again. Uh, just again, uh, uh, as a precursor to what he's about to share this morning, uh, remember, the, the people that we've invited to the platform this morning, 
or this morning, every week, are people who have shown themselves to be faithful with the handling of God's word, who have a, a gifting or the capacity to preach, to teach, to speak, which we believe our brother has. But most importantly, every person who has had the opportunity or the privilege to stand up here and preach from this platform, they're here not because of their ability, they're not here because of their years of service, they're here because of the character of their heart. And we affirm this morning the character of Christ in our brother, his desire not to be heard, not to be recognized, but to advance the kingdom of God and to see each of us continue to grow in our relationship with him. So let's just stretch out your hands. We'll just pray for our brother this morning. Father God, we thank you for the life of Jesus Christ in our brother Max. And we pray this morning, Lord, that as he ministers the word to each of us, our hearts would be filled and satisfied, Lord. Your word says, taste and see that you are good. And this morning, Lord, we desire to taste and eat the bread that you have provided, Lord, for each of us here in this place. May your blessing and your peace be upon our brother as he ministers the word and as he ministers to each of our hearts. Amen. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Who's happy to be here? All three of us. Great. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I'm glad that I was uh, invited back. That means I did okay. Um, and I have an amazing message here for you. But before we do that, I, I know we prayed. I'd like to pray uh, myself. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for your victory before it's even here. I want to thank you for your grace. Those chains that are in this place, they will be broken in your name. Because it's not us doing the work, it's you. And that is where I take full confidence, knowing that you are going to do something here today. And I'm very excited to see your power here today. Clear our minds and, and calm our hearts so we could receive your word and be changed. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Last time I spoke here, um, when all, all was said and done, the service ended, and uh, there's an individual that came up to me, and this individual said, it is really nice uh, to see young people do their thing. And I'm like, young people? <laughs> I'm almost 40. I am not young. <laughs> I, have, I have like, I wake up in the morning at 6 o'clock to go to work, just like all the rest of us responsible old people do. And I place my alarm clock downstairs. And it's very strategic that I do that because if it's beside me, I'll just keep hitting the snooze button. But when it's downstairs, I have the rest of my family to worry about. And I, I, that's the alarm clock I don't want to wake up to. So I would have to run down, turn it off, and everybody has a great time. But I noticed this one time, the alarm clock rang, and my mind said one thing, let's move it, move it, let's go, 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 go. But my body said another thing. It was like creaking and squeaking, and I looked like a penguin walking down the stairs. My joints just wouldn't bend. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what is going on? And I know that it's unfair to say that I relate to the older crowd here, but I think I relate. <laughs> it's one of those things when you know, you know, like your bones start squeaking and, and all, all that kind of stuff. You don't understand what's happening with your body and and, and things happen, you, you really question life at that moment. But only, you know, like I say this as if this is like the most traumatic thing that ever happened to me, and I, I only joke, but it's only if that was the biggest problem we had, our squeaky bones. Wouldn't that be a good life? I wouldn't mind a squeaky bone here and there if I could take away some of the troubles that I went through. And as we grow, we start to understand with our maturity that there are things that come at us without us wanting it. We have no control. 
There are inevitable things that we face like pain and struggle. There are times where we face failure and mistakes when we fall and sin. And these things, as we grow, we start to understand that they do take a big toll on our life and our decision making and the way that we view life and then the way that we view culture, the way that we view religion, the way that we view God. But there's one thing that gets us through every single time and it's the grace of God. And it's only by his grace we could get through this because trust me, I tried doing it on my own. Only more problems came. Today I named the sermon the signature of grace in Jesus' name. And I did that very strategically because we will be talking about things very, very basic things. Like we're, we're, I'm saying we're taking it back to Sunday school basic things. There's a lot we're going to unpack today, so I hope you packed your lunches. <laughs> but grace is one of those things that every person needs to experience. If you can't experience grace, it'll be just a life, a lonely life, a broken life, and a desperate life. And I'm here to tell you that grace is in this place. You just need to reach out to it. The Lord has already come here before we have. He's already met you when that alarm clock downstairs rang and you were running like a penguin. He's already met you there. Grace is in this place. I, uh, I, I have two girls. Uh, their names are Emma and Lexi, right? Um, they're nine and seven. And I do, we do a lot of fun things together. And one of, the, one of my favorite, they're, they're full of energy. It's a very busy day in our household. Um, one of my favorite times is bedtime. Maybe it calms down. <laughs> but not only because I get to rest after a very long day, but we, we do different things during bedtime. My favorite that we, we do is story time. And I would call one of them to one, one's room and I would sit them down on the, on the bed and they know what's coming and they're like all excited with their smiles and, and I'm there, I'm, I'm prepared, I'm ready to go. And then I start off by going, once upon a time, there were, there were two people named Shlema and Shlexi. And then they would giggle. It was like, Papa, are you talking about us? I'm like, no, your, your name is Emma and Lexi. Come on. And then I would continue. Shlema and Shlexi, they were sisters and best friends. And then they would giggle some more. I'm like, not you. <laughs> but they love these stories where it, it, it goes into like this mystical forest and, and, and stuff like that. So then the story would go on that they, they lived in a town with Mayor Schmax. And this one time, everybody in this town was grumpy, including the mayor, and they needed to find a cure for this grumpiness. So they would set out on this mission into this mystical forest to find this cure. And along the way, they would meet different kinds of characters like talking squirrels and friendly furry animals and the, and the funny rabbit. And they would look for this, this cure, this mystical living water. And they would look for it, and they would have fun. It's not a scary story, it's bedtime, so we need to calm things down. And they finally get to this living water. And then they realize at that point that this, they can't rely on other people to bring joy and other things to bring joy. So they would take a drink of this living water and they would take this living water and bring it back to the town. And they would give it to everybody. And everybody would become happy and joyful and life goes on. And the moral of the story is that this living water is Jesus. That's where we get our joy from. Not our parents, not our circumstances, but we go to Jesus. So anyways, then I say the end. 
And then they would look at each other and they would hug each other and they go, Emma, I love you, Lexi, I love you. And they run off and, and, and we have a great night. At this point, although they, they know and I, I told them that these characters are not them, they, they understood that they were part of the story. It was very relatable to them. And somehow they were placed in that story and they lived that story and, and at the very end they became best friends again after the whole day and they went off. It was for them. And I took this strategy from one of the best storytellers that has ever lived. And the way that Jesus would ta- tell his stories is he would take different plots, different characters, and he would tell it to the audience that was there listening to them. And somehow, they just understood. They understood that this is a message for them. They understood that wh- whoever is in that story are them. And we call these stories parables. And today I really want to, I want to focus on one parable. Again, we're taking it back to the basics. And if I asked all of you, you probably would guess what parable I'd be talking to. It's like one of like four or five. But we'll be talking about the prodigal son today. But this parable is involved with two other parables. It's It's in a group of three. And it's important to note that because it has a big message. So you you would have to read through them all to understand. And when I read the Bible, when I try and and do an in-depth study, I I try and be like this investigator, you know? Like, I want to know who was there. I want to know who who said what, where they're standing, what kind of emotions. Like, I I really want to dive into the story to understand the context. And that's what we'll do. We'll do it really quickly. So 90% of the time, you're going to think that I'm just aimlessly talking because we're going to be talking about context. But the 10% at the very end is what the reason I'm here, okay? So if you want to take a snooze, we'll wake you up later when it really matters. <laughs> but before we do that, I want to prepare our hearts for, the, for, for this um, parable. It's a very important parable. Whether you're a new Christian or a, a mature Christian, It's a great reminder to our roots of faith. And in order to prepare our hearts for this, we need decisions to be made here today. In Genesis 11.31, it says, Terah took his son Abraham, his grandson Lot, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abraham's wife, and they set out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah, his goal was to get to Canaan. But something happened when he hit this city, and we don't know what it is, whether he got comfortable, whether the road was too hard. And the scripture says he settled. And later, that's where he died. He didn't reach the land, his goal My prayer today, as we're reading through the scriptures, is that we won't settle. That we would would choose change. So that the person that you came in today would be a, a, a different, a better version walking out. And it's a decision we need to make. So let's let's get going. So Luke. 15, Luke 15. So it it starts by saying this. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now the investigator me, I'm already looking at the characters. There's the audience that is listening to Jesus. There's the sinners, the tax collectors, and the famous Pharisees. Now, the sinners, we, we, pro- uh, we probably know. They're, they're the people that uh, do not live godly lives. They do not care about it. They just live the way they want. They live a life of, in sin. Then we see the tax collectors. And the way we read it is like, oh, the tax collectors are probably um, not so good people. But the way that they understood it back then is like, 
There's the sinners, and then there's the tax collectors. They had their own category. Like, they were hated more than the sinners. For the reason that these tax collectors were were Jewish people that were hired by the Roman Empire to go back to the Jewish people and collect taxes. And not only was that bad enough because people couldn't afford this kind of stuff, these tax collectors would take more on top for themselves. They would would give out loans that had high interest if people couldn't pay. And they would take absolutely everything they could to the last penny. They were considered traitors doing this to their own people. And we see a lot of these examples in the Bible where there's a famous tax collector named Zacchaeus. We sang his song, Zacchaeus. I'm not going to do it, but we see that this man, he, he saw Jesus. He, want, he heard about him, and he came but he couldn't see Jesus, so he climbed a tree, and then Jesus looks at him and says, we're going to your house today. And in the same way, in that story, there, the crowd murmured amongst each other, oh, this Jesus is going to dinner with these sinners and tax collectors. And Zacchaeus heard that, and he said, to anyone that I have cheated here, I will give you four times more. That is how rich he was. Gives you an idea of how much they take. Another famous tax collector is the disciple Matthew. That's actually how Jesus met Matthew. He was collecting taxes. He says, Matthew, follow me. And he says, okay. And he followed him. And again, it created this tension between Jesus and the Pharisees, these teachers of the law, because they didn't understand. Their whole life, was devoted to the Torah. The the five books, the first books of the Hebrew Bible, they would memorize it word for word. They would memorize all the 600 plus laws that was given to them. And they just couldn't understand the fact that this Jesus that claims to be this Messiah would want to hang out with people that don't like him. And it created this tension. We could start seeing that in this story. So Jesus overheard this, and he, he, he heard the Pharisees all again talking about the sinners and the tax collectors, and he decided to tell these three parables, these three stories. Now, we have to remember, because when we read this, the prodigal son, when we talk about amongst each other and stuff, it's just a story, It's just a story. It's not real life. And that's important. It's an important role to play when we're actually trying to understand the lessons it teaches. So he starts with the first one um, in Luke 15. It's about lost sheep. And we see the story going out that there was a shepherd. There was 100 sheep. One went straight away. The shepherd went and he found the sheep. And then he brought it back to the 99. But then he calls his friends and family, and and he says, we need to celebrate. In 15.7, it says, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you that the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And we got to remember, the Pharisees are listening to this. And then he goes on to the next story. So we have the 100 sheep. Now there's a woman that has 10 coins, and she loses one. And she's looking and looking. She is looking everywhere for this coin and finally finds it. And then she calls out her friends, and we need need to do a party. Let's rejoice. Let's celebrate, because I found my coin. And in the same way, this is what Jesus said, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And without any break, he moves into the last parable of this set. It's the prodigal son. He would forcefully take the inheritance, the wealth from his father, 
and then he would run away, he would spend it, and, and he would be working for a farmer, wishing he could eat the food of the, of the pigs there. And, and, and spoiler alert, he does come back, and they live happily ever after. And when he was about to say this story, I really got to really think that there is a progression between all these parables. We see that, it, it, he, that Jesus focuses on the one in a hundred, one in ten, and then a very personal one, one in one. And to me, this is telling me that you could hide in a hundred faces and God will still seek you out. You could be in a little tiny group of friends and God is still going to pursue you. And you could be in a closed room trying to avoid life, being all lonely. God will really meet with you there too. There is this progression of it doesn't matter because the most important thing, the most valuable thing here is you. And he really hits home with this one. Verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them not long after that, the younger son got to, together, all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went, to, to, uh, he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And we look at this son in this story, and from a third-person perspective, we're like, don't do it. Just don't do it. You, you, your life is going to end up where you don't want it to end up. But I think we could really relate to this son, because a lot of the times in life, when we, when we see this failure, this regret, the the, this, the struggle, the addiction, we, we start looking back. It's like only if I saw my life in the third person. We, we make certain decisions that just don't make sense. In Matthew 6.21, it says, for where your treasure is, your heart will also be there. And I could really see that this son's heart wasn't with his father. He had different ideas. His treasure was somewhere else. His treasure was having a good time. His treasure was accumulating this wealth. His treasure was to, to have many, many friends. And because that's where his treasure was, his heart was there also. And over time, he would tell his father, hey, I want my inheritance and I, I dare to say, like, I know that he was, he's entitled to his inheritance and stuff. I, I personally think he just stole it. Like, he needed to wait. That's not fair for me. Like, I'm like, you know, he probably, he stole his money to, to accomplish his dream. The son wanted happiness. He wanted this excitement. He wanted fulfillment and ended up broken, lonely, and desperate. And it's very evident to me that he already took this journey in his heart. A lot of us here, we, we know what's in our heart. We see the journeys we take within our heart that nobody else sees. The thoughts that go in our mind. And This part of the story is really teaching us to take captive of those thoughts and to realize what the younger brother realizes is that the value is not in something you can buy or replace, but it's in unseen things. It's in the love of the Father. It's in this grace. And for some of us, this is the message. Take captive of those thoughts. And don't wait on them 
Don't discard them. Don't ignore them. Bring them to Jesus. It is okay to bring them to Jesus. Listen, God, this is what I'm thinking. I know this is really bad. These are the thoughts. Give a conversation with them. Because I think if this younger son would have had a conversation with his father about his feelings and what his dreams were, things could have ended differently. Then it goes on in verse 17. When he came to his senses and he said, how many of the father's hired servants have food to spare? And I here am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and found. So they began to celebrate. And I, I honestly can't really tell you anything new about this part. We've all heard many sermons. We've heard many preachers just talk about this stuff. We've talked about one another. So there's really nothing new here. But to me, I, I honestly, I tried. I tried to figure out a way to, to display this compassion and this love, and I couldn't. It just didn't make sense. And this is why it's so important to understand that this isn't a true story that happened. But the truth of this story is true. And I think that this compassion and this love isn't meant to be understood. It's meant to be taken. It's meant to be walked into rather than understood. A lot of the time, we see a lot of Christians trying to understand things that cannot be understood. And they fall because it's not logical. There's not a lot of things that is logical to us because we're human. We are sinful. What makes sense to God does not make sense to me. So if we try and make it logical, we we're gonna fall into a place of trouble. But there is one thing I could say, and it's to read a verse. In Psalm 103, verse 10 to 13, it says, the Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And I think in this part of the story, we just need to understand that the change that the son went through was genuine. It wasn't him going, oh, I lost everything. It's just easier life with my dad. I'm just gonna go back. It was a genuine change. It was so genuine. Did did you notice how long it took him to make that trip back? He had to hire himself out after losing absolutely everything. He had to starve when the economy was just just terrible. And he wanted to eat the food of the pigs. That's how long it took him to get this courage to go back to the father. I I honestly wouldn't know. I would be in the same position. I would feel shame. Can you imagine, like, you taking an inheritance and then just losing it all foolishly? Like, so much money, and you just wasted it on useless things. Not only that, you're eating food of the pigs, or at least you want to, and you were so used to eating great food. And then you, I picture my dad's face, 
Like going back to that, I would feel shame. I'm like, Dad, you won't be proud of me. But I think when we focus more on our failures, on our bad decisions that we make, on our struggles, on the chains that we have, we miss the point of the Father's compassion. And I could tell you that because he lived with him. He knew exactly who the Father was. In this story, Jesus was creating this Father to be gentle and patient and loving. And the son's failures blocked that. And all he could see is these make-believe things. Oh, he's going to be mad. There is going to be dis... I can't go back to him. He's going to be disappointed. And he forgot who the father really was. So the story goes on. Um, Let's uh, do 25 to 30. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come back, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he, was, uh, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, I've never disobeyed your orders, and yet you are giving me, um, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when his son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill a fattened cow for him. There are two things I really notice in this, and it's that the older brother really lives life off of work and merit. He feels that he he will deserve the love of the father because he works harder, he never disobeys him, and he, he puts this whole idea over work and merit. But I think the underlying issue here, the thing that he doesn't know that he has a problem with, is not his, the, the brother coming back home. It, it, he, I don't think he really cared about that. When all is said and done, I think he really had the trouble accepting what grace looks like. He's like, sure, the brother came home, but he needs to be disciplined. He needs to be taught a lesson. Did you not see what what he did? And what made him even more mad is that I have been so good to you, Dad, and he's getting more than me. I, I didn't get a party to celebrate my goodness. This grace doesn't make sense to him. And it's so easy to be in a place where we accept it. But it's really hard to see somebody else accept it. To see somebody else that has fallen come back to the church and all of a sudden be reinstated. To see somebody that has been making decision after wrong decision in their, in their faithful walk with, with God come back and still be able to use their gifts. We get mad. We're like, I've been faithful my whole life. And yet, look at this. Like, they, they receive more. And I think that the issue here is also the issue with mature Christians. Because we tend to fall into this ritualistic life that the Pharisees faced. And it is no secret what Jesus thought of the, of the Pharisees. On so many times, he called them snakes and brought vipers, and they were whitewashed, they were hypocrites, pre- preaching the things that, um, that, they don't even, that they don't even do. It was no secret. They, they would walk out into streets and pray for the only reason for people to see them pray. They would memorize this, this Torah, the Bible, 
for people to hear them recite it because they are so smart. And I honestly don't think it's too different if we come to church every Sunday, we pray our prayer, sing our songs, and then go back home and not do that same there. We play the role, and we live life by, by works and merit, and then we go back home, and life goes on. Some of us, we're, we're, very, we're different than this brother, but there are qualities that we possess that are the same. Grace. And it really gets me to, to see how the father replies. This is my favorite part of the story, is the father's reply. He says in Luke 15, 31, my son. So he starts off by saying, my son. He is not stranger. It's not hired servant. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Listen, you, you, you are my name. You could have tapped into this, but you were too busy working. You could have asked, but you were too busy working. And so many of us here were too busy sitting. We could tap in to the name, to this identity of Christ and receive his blessings and receive his giftings. But we're scared to. Maybe this is the message for you. Just tap in because your identity is Jesus Christ. Tap in to his love and his blessings. And, the, and this is what the father's telling him. You could have had this. You could have had the party in the calf. You just never did it. But we had to celebrate and be glad because the brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And why it's my favorite is because the father is taking the view off of works and trying to get the view on and the focus on to identity. Identity is absolutely everything here because that is where we are valued the most. The Bible says our, the best works that we have are like dirty rags. The best works that you, you, could, you could think of the best idea and, and give up all your, all your possessions and everything, the Bible says it's just dirty rags without Christ. It's the identity, this brother lost his identity and he was dead, but now he is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. The value sits in that. In the year uh, 2012, there was a person that paid almost $390,000 for a baseball. You could go into a store and buy that same baseball for less than $10 and bring it to this baseball that was apparently worth $390,000. It'd be the same weight, made out of the same material, have the same stitching. It'd be exactly the same. The only difference here was that the name written on that ball it wasn't the ball he was buying. It was the name that was written on the ball. It was Babe Ruth, one of the most famous baseball players ever, that ever lived. And he was written. And somebody paid $390,000 for that name. And I'm here to tell you that your value sits on the name that is written on your life. But you're like, oh, my life. You don't know what I'm into. You don't know the sin I'm in. You don't know the struggle. I'm just dirty. But I'm going to tell you, that ball that was worth $390,000 had seen the highs and the lows. It was hit with the baseball bat. It had dings, and it was dirty. There were scratches, and it was still worth $390,000. It has nothing to do with the dirt and filth that you think is in your life. Because there is this compassion and this love that just doesn't care because when the Father looks at you, 
He sees Jesus. Jesus has died on the cross once and for all, for you and for me, for everybody. And you cannot undo that with any excuse you have. The value is on your life. And I think there are some people here that are in their struggle that are afraid to come back. And I, I'll tell you that your struggle and this, this feeling of fail is, is just really distracting you from the real version of who the God the Father is. And I'm telling you, if you make the decision right now to drop things and to head right back, he will meet you before you're even out. He is pursuing you because he sees Jesus. Whether you, you, you judge people, it doesn't matter how you act when somebody cuts you off in the road, it doesn't matter. Jesus loves you and wants to be with you no matter what. No matter what. So I'm going to end by, by saying, don't settle. Right? Don't settle in a place of comfort. Don't settle in a place of sin. Don't settle with failure. Don't settle with the feelings. Whether you relate more to the younger brother or you relate more to the older brother, the call is there for you to take up this identity, to take up the cross and follow him daily. And I just pray that our life outside of these four walls, outside of this building, looks the same as it does when we're here. We're full of prayer, full of, full of readings and full of love. Tapping in to your identity. And if we could just all stand right now. I'm, I'm not going to call any, this is not an altar call. I'm not going to call you forward or anything like that. But I, I would like for everybody to close their eyes. And I want to talk to those people right now that had some sort of effect with this message. If, if you feel like God is speaking to you right now to drop a few things, to drop a struggle, to stop thinking a certain way, to stop judging people, to whatever it may be, if you feel like it's time for you to come home, Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you really feel it. If you feel like the Father's really calling you out. And now, to everybody around, I want, I want to finish by saying this, that this moment for them is not a sad moment, it's a moment of celebration and it's a happy moment. There were hands being raised all over and we're gonna clap for them. Let's, let's just give them a round of applause saying, yes, you are welcome back. This is a great decision. You are wanted and this life is for you no matter what. Don't let it stop you. Grace is in this place and the signature of grace is on your life. Amen.
Thank you for that word, Max. I know it spoke to everybody around here, uh, just the releasing of that grace in our hearts. Guys, the Lord is speaking to us very clearly. We are his children, and he loves us. He loves us so much that he is wanting to pour out his power on each one of us. So let's keep our eyes on him. Father, I pray your blessing on this congregation. I pray your blessing on each one that's here. Lord God, make your face shine upon us. Lord God, may we look into your face and see the love that you have for each one of us and the grace that you have. And Lord, may we lay aside every weight of sin in Jesus' name and just allow you to move in our hearts. We praise you and we thank you and glorify you. Folks, have a blessed week. And if you need prayer, we have the prayer team up here around on this side.